Okay, good morning again. And I apologize, I'm not the best with the lapels, but I'm going to sit it right here. But if for some reason I accidentally bump it or turn it off, just let me know and we'll... You have such an awesome tech team here. I'm not used to that. Usually when I um, visit a church, I might have one person on tech. So thank you so much for the awesome welcome. Um, it's, it's, you know, I said the word lively. It's really refreshing to be at, at such a warm and energetic church. Um, so anyone who says the church is in trouble or, um, you know, the people aren't coming to church, people, church isn't important anymore, well, they need to visit New Bethel UMC, let me tell you. So, yes, give yourself applause. And if you don't mind, too, we love to show off our adventures. So before I forget, from here in the pulpit, I'm going to snap a quick picture of you all. So everybody wave. Yep. How do you want one, two, three? And one more, one, two, three. Well, I have to back up to get everybody in there. So thank you so much again. Um, one of my favorite parts about working at Cunningham is the chance to get to do these visits um, and to share with you all who make such an impact on the youth and families we serve, um, you know, to share with you how that you are doing that, how your support matters, um, and how you truly are um, and providing light and hope in the lives of the youth and families that we serve at Cunningham. Um, you know, speaking of light, as an agency, we've adopted this idea of light growing from just a narrow kind of laser beam when we focus on our residential care, which is what you might know us best for, uh, to now the work we do shines um, a spotlight with a variety of programs that impact not just the kids who live with us, but really the entire community and, um, and impact reverberates through the entire state of Illinois. A lot of you have know our storied history of Cunningham Children's Home, but I'll give you a quick recap if this is the first time you're hearing about us. We were established in 1895 when Judge Joseph and Mary Cunningham deeded their large country estate in rural Urbana. It was actually their summer home, believe it or not. Um, not to the United Methodist Church, but specifically to the women that were doing mission in the United Methodist Church. So I don't know what that says about church politics, even back 130 years ago, but I know that they believed and um, were correct to know that women would always be good stewards of the mission. The day the home was deeded, Judge Joe wrote in his journal, may God's blessings go with this gift and may it be the means of doing much good. Now, the women have served, again, as incredible stewards of our mission for over 129 years, and that includes generations of women and units from uh, the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, um, but also that includes generations of women from this church. So um, I'll say it again, but um, you know, thank you for all of the work that your United Women in Faith have done in years past um, and continue to do today and will do in the future to serve our youth and families. These women have served alongside our staff. They've answered the calls of support to provide funding and in-kind items, and they've prayed for our young people and families. Um, and through the years, the women have also made sure that our youth have the same childhood experiences as their peers. So that's getting to try sports, getting to have a prom, trying musical instruments, going on fishing trips, um, making sure they feel loved at Christmas or on their birthday, you know, but also those fun outings like trips to the movies and special dinners out. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned it in my children's message, but we also have the incredible 129-year tradition um, that quilters help us uh, maintain uh, by working overtime to make sure that all of the kids who come into our programs have a beautiful quilt um, and that they get their own quilt to take with them to make them feel safe and warm. These are all examples of how the women have been a light for our ministry, and we are so grateful. Today, though, I mentioned Cunningham's no longer a traditional orphanage, but we continue to be an exemplary child welfare agency. Last year, we actually served 846 um, individuals and families through three main programs, and that's residential treatment, community-based counseling services, and special education. A majority of those who are referred to us come through either state or community child welfare agencies. 55% uh, of them are between the ages of 10 and 19 years old. So we do really good with that tween um, age group that can be tough 
uh, times. Yeah, there we go. Well done. I was about to say, man, your tech team is so awesome. I'm not used to this royal treatment here. Um, okay. Um, in our residential treatment program, so um, we actually have two programs that work with young people now to overcome the impact of trauma. Uh, the first one serves kids from all over the state uh, that I mentioned um, our DCFS youth, so Youth and Protective Services that are trying to overcome trauma after years of neglect and abuse. Um, but the other residential program, which is more recent, we just started serving youth in 2021, is called Caminos. And it's a separate program. The kids don't live in the same quarters. It's two separate uh, residential programs on our campus. But Caminos is a federal program that provides temporary care. And we actually served unaccompanied migrant youth who have crossed the border at the southern part of the US. Um, it's been determined that they meet the requirements to seek asylum here. Um, and we help them reach the family members that they were seeking when they made their journeys to escape uh, the trauma of gang violence, political unrest, and extreme poverty. They're only with us a short amount of time. Um, and again, we're doing what we can to reunite them with the family that's already here. Um, we also have three school programs that offer special education for children with autism mental health challenges, and learning disabilities that for whatever reason their local school system couldn't address. And then our most recent expansion of services um, is we have a variety of community-based programs. We provide individual and family counseling, um, housing and educational assistance for homeless youth, and then also support for families with children who are at risk of entering the juvenile justice system. So put, taking mental health support out into the community, um, trying to create uh, systemic change by doing intervention and providing support earlier to families when they're in crisis. <sighs> okay, I'm out of breath. Right? And, you know, today I know that all of these programs I've listed are so much more, you know, than the orphanage that Judge Joe and Mary Cunningham envisioned, but I'm certain that they would continue to be so proud of um, what we've become and the good that we do today. And while facts and figures can be impressive and meaningful, with my remaining time, I want to share some stories about Cunningham kids and their real life experiences and how we see God's light break through. Um, you know, the famous scripture from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, when the earth was formless and empty, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God turns darkness into light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. All of us go through difficult times, uh, sometimes even dark times. And I can tell you that the youth that live at Cunningham Children's Home have definitely walked in a deep darkness. Um, they've lived a lot of their childhood in darkness. They've experienced abuse, trauma, neglect, and just an overall feeling of being unloved and unwanted. The darkness seemed like it might overtake them. But I'm happy to say that the darkness did not overcome the light. God still shines, and many of them have seen that light. And the truth is that Jesus is still shining. Even in these days of turmoil and tragedy, the light of Christ cannot be stopped. God always finds a way to break through with help and hope. Amen. Yeah. So today I want to share just four ways um, that you all have helped us see and experience the light, the light of Christ. 
Um, and hopefully, too, in hearing this, you might also recognize where you've had experiences in your own life um, to see the light of Christ in these same ways. One of the ways that we can find light is in worship. We come to worship and we take ourselves to a place to be with God. And when that happens, amazing things can and do happen. The pastor says just what we needed to hear. A song that is sung spoke, speaks directly to our heart. Or you feel Christ's love as you receive communion. On his very first day at Cunningham, Andrew came to chapel. He hadn't been to church in a long time, but he was in a new place and he wanted a new start. And the Bible verse that night was from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Our chaplain explained that Jesus does not force his way into our lives. He knocks at the door of our hearts, and it's up to us to open the door and invite him into our lives. After the service was over, Andrew came up to the chaplain and said the last thing that his mother had said to him before he left to come to Cunningham was to open the door and let Jesus into his life. And that chapel service that night was a sign to him that he was in the place where God wanted him to be. And he said, I'm ready to really open the door to God and let him change my life. Andrew shared, Andrew saw the light. Uh, during Lent, our chaplain, um, you know, do and partake in what a lot of us experience. Um, they learn about how sometimes for Lent people give something up or maybe they add something each day um, to help them be more aware of God over you know, the 40 days of the Lenten season. Maybe they give up sweets and exercise more, or they decide to do something kind every day. We were about 30 days into Lent when one of our young high school-aged girls came into the chapel. It was her birthday, and she had dressed up. The chaplain wished her a happy birthday and said, Oh, my goodness, you look so nice. And she said, Thanks, but I blew it. And the chaplain looked at her and said, What do you mean you blew it? And she said, Well, I gave up makeup for Lent. But since it was my birthday, I felt like I needed to wear makeup today. I didn't make it all the way to Easter. And the chaplain said, you know, that's okay. You know, God knows where your heart is. We've all kind of been there. Um, and she said, did you learn anything, though, during those weeks where you didn't wear makeup? And she said, yeah, I learned that I'm beautiful without it. So th this young woman had low self-esteem. She was always comparing herself to others. But she learned she was beautiful without makeup. The light broke through. Another night, a staff member shared with Chaplain what happened after the kids had come back to their home unit setting on our campus um, after chapel. Um, and the staff member said, you know, tonight after chapel, while the girls were having a snack, Jemiah said she was touched by the message you gave about how God heals broken hearts. And Jemiah said that after all she had been through in her life, now her heart was being fixed. This started all the other girls talking about their past, and we had to pass the Kleenex box around, but it was in a good way. Um, and before Jemiah went to bed, all of a sudden she came out and she asked for red construction paper. So the staff went and got her the red construction paper. Um, but you know, if you have kids that you're putting to bed, it's never just one thing, right? So first it was construction paper, um, and uh, then she wanted some tape. And so the staff obliged, and so she started to cut out a big heart, and then just as soon as it was finished, she started to tear it up. And so I think the staff was a little worried about, oh, goodness, what direction is this going? But then she took the tape, and she started to tape all the pieces back together. And she hung it on the door to show everyone how God can fix a broken heart. And so, of course, she did it, and um, that idea and notion uh, spread to the other girls in the living area. And um, before you knew it, they were all cutting out hearts and tearing them up and taping them back together. And every girl had a heart stuck on their door when they went to bed that night. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, the staff said, I could see and feel God working in them. The girls had seen the light. When we see the light, our eyes, our ears, and our hearts are opened, and we experience the goodness and the presence of God. Another way we find light is in study. Um, now, if you know the history of Methodism, you know, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, um, reported that he felt his heart strangely warmed during a Bible study one night. And maybe that doesn't seem like a place where such a powerful experience of God should happen, you know, just in a kind of low-key Bible study. But it did, and it does. And so a second way we see light is through study and discussion. 
Um, our chaplain shared this story um, that one Sunday there were three teenage boys that were in her spiritual life group. And um, they were all kind of at different paces of learning. So she had one that needed things explained very simplistically and slowly. Then she had a second one that caught on to things very quickly. And then there was a third one that could not get over whose car that was in the parking lot. I've never seen that car before. Whose car is it? Are they a new person? Is it a visitor? Is it a staff member? And, um, you know, if you're a Sunday school teacher, maybe you can all relate to what the chaplain was thinking at that point was, oh, my gosh, I'm doing my best to engage all of these, each of these kids in a different way, but I don't feel like any of them are getting anything out of it. Um, you know, but some days are just like that. So she continued to try and work through the lesson, and they were about done when all of a sudden the second boy um, exclaimed, my heart, and he clutched his chest. And so, all, you know, the chaplain hears that, sees that, and thinks, oh, my gosh, medical emergency, you know, and she's, what's going on? Do you feel sick? Let me call the staff. And he says, no, my heart. I feel like something warm is in there. And then he said, like, all my sins were just lifted out of me. Teenage boy, to have that kind of um, moment with God and she can't believe it. Her jaw's on the floor. Um, I think her heart was racing too, but she was relieved. She wasn't have to, going to have to call 911. You know? And she looks to see what the other boys in the group are doing while her and this young man are having this incredible experience. The first boy was not aware that anything was going on. He'd started doodling you know, on his page. And that third boy was still looking out the window, just could not get over whose car was that was in the parking lot. Um, but she said, you know, I was able to witness this young man have this experience and the, knowing that the dwelling, uh, uh, there was a dwelling presence of Christ. And so she gave him a journal that day so that he could write down what that moment felt like so that he wouldn't forget. And this is what he wrote. I had an experience with God during group today, and it was amazing. I felt a sudden rush of love and warmth all through my body. I hope that I have another experience like this. Thank you, God, for giving me this day to live and breathe. The light of God had warmed his heart. Another time, uh, during Vacation Bible School, uh, the chaplain created, um, and this is usually our, the best day of Vacation Bible School, we have this huge whale that we make out of plastic sheets, and then there's a little blower, so it stays inflated, and all the kids and the chaplain get to crawl in there. And um, they only have the light from a small flashlight, uh, gathered inside the dark whale, and they hear the story of Jonah and how he prayed inside the belly of the whale. And that Jonah promised God that if he survived the experience, he would do what God asked him to do, and he would make better choices. So sitting there inside the whale, one girl said, this story is showing me that God placed me at Cunningham to give me another chance. God wants me to learn how to live my life the right way, and that's what I'm going to do. Inside the whale, she saw the light. Another one of our young women, Stella, grew up in a crack house. She would sleep in cars. Sometimes she'd sleep in the street. And when she came to Cunningham, Stella soaked up as many Bible stories as she could. She was really eager to learn more about God. And one day she heard the story of the lost lamb. Jesus said, if you have a hundred sheep and you lose one of them, you go after it. You leave the 99 others and you go and search for the lost one. And when you find it, you carry it home joyfully on your shoulders. Then you call your friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And that's Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. After Stella heard that story during chapel, she said, You're not going to believe this. All my life, I've had a little stuffed lamb. It's the one thing I've had with me the whole time, even when I was homeless. He's dirty and almost worn out. But now I know why I've had him all along. Because I'm Jesus' lost lamb. He's been looking for me, and now he's found me. It all made sense. Stella saw the light. Um, again, I mentioned the Caminos program um, earlier. And uh, even though these youth are with us a much shorter amount of time, while they are, we um, provide a safe and secure place for them to live. But they also get spiritual guidance. Um, a lot of these young people have made this journey on their home from countries in Central America. That's where most of them come from. But what's so cool about this program, it's dynamic enough that it's open to any youth that arrives at the southern border. So this year alone, we've had youth from Haiti. Um, we had one arrive last week that's from Ghana. We've had some from the Congo. 
We've even, um, when the crisis with Ukraine and Russia broke out, we even had boys from Ukraine come through the program. Um, so again, it, you know, a lot of the ones from South America are um, looking and fleeing this incredible violence from the cartels. Um, but all of them, no matter what country they're coming from, are coming to the U.S. to be safe. And they're placed temporarily in our care while uh, we work on the reunification with the family that's already here. And so um, they were meeting with the chaplain. And the chaplain uh, that day, the lesson was, um, she was sharing the 23rd Psalm. Um, and it takes a little bit to share some activities because sometimes there's a language barrier. So we use a lot of Google Translate. Um, but it's amazing, too, that what you don't need to translate and what doesn't know any language is love. And there's a lot of ways you can make kids feel welcome and safe and loved without necessarily speaking the same language. But anyway, during um, as they were working through the 23rd Psalm, they discussed how the Good Shepherd leads and guides us. And um, so the chaplain asked, you know, what's the most helpful verse to you from this Psalm? And it was kind of quiet. All of them were a little, you know, anxious to be the first one to raise our hand. Um, but then the oldest boy in the group, who was 15, he raised our, his hand, and in Spanish he said, he's our shepherd, he takes care of us. Jesus got us through the valley we traveled to get here. And all the boys nodded. Clearly, God's light showed these young people the way to find safety. When we read and discuss the word of God, when we participate in Bible study, sometimes when we least expect it, a message from God breaks through, and we see things in a new and different way. The word of God illuminates our path. And so, again, sometimes the third way that we find um, the light is through spiritual practice. Uh, in spiritual practice is through prayer. In difficult times, we often cry out to God. We pray for help, for understanding, for strength, and for answers. Several years ago, the chaplain went to visit a young woman in the local juvenile detention center. As they sat together in a cubicle, uh, the chaplain reassured her that God loved her and wanted her to have a good life. And as the conversation was winding down, the woman looked at the chaplain and paused, and she said, you know, yesterday I prayed for a sign that it wasn't too late for me, and today you came. She saw the light. Desmond, another one of our youth, was having a bad day, and he turned to God for help and wrote this prayer. Lord, I ask that you will always give us a hand to hold through life. I ask that you will guide us on a successful trail through life. Let us learn to love all and not to have so much hatred in our lives. Lord, let us see struggles coming our way and help us fight the evil. Help us stay on our feet and pick us up when we fall. I ask that you bring us back together when we fall apart. I ask that you shine the light on us, letting us know that you are always here. Um, and then after he wrote the prayer, Desmond felt better. He felt God's light shining on him. When we pray God's love will break through and illuminate our lives in unexpected ways, and it does in surprising places. The love of God is like a light that brings us hope and reassurance. All right, and the final way that we find light is through service. Uh, generosity, helpfulness, and service to others can be part of our spiritual DNA. We do things for others to pass on the love of Christ, but often in the process, we are blessed as well. And often while helping others, Jesus brings us some new insight. At Cunningham, you know, so many kids rally and support our youth that we also try and teach them uh, to do acts of generosity themselves, to pay it forward. Um, and so our youth were participating and doing a service project for Meals on Wheels. Um, but because of, you know, we have vulnerable youth, they weren't actually able to deliver the meals. But they were making small table decorations that would be packaged along with the meals and delivered by other volunteers to the seniors. And so they watched video of a volunteer making the rounds and delivering the meals to get a better understanding of, you know, how the Meals on Wheels mission works. And the seniors in the video talked about how they looked forward to the daily conversation as much as the food. And after one of the young women, um, you know, after the video, the chaplain looked around and one of the young women in our group was sobbing. And, you know, the chaplain started to panic and think like, oh gosh, I didn't realize that, you know, what was in the video that I missed. And the young girl said, I didn't know there were people as lonely as me. I never thought about getting old and living alone. This has changed my life. So God's light broke through. Um, the high school girls from the girls group home really wanted to have a Passover meal like the one that Jesus ate with his disciples the night before he died. So the chaplain wanted to make it authentic. She bought lamb, unleavened bread, eggs, parsley, and grape juice, and then she explained the meaning of the Jewish holiday. And she told them Jesus gave new meaning to the meal. 
Jesus gave them bread and said, This is my body broken for you. He gave them wine and said, My blood is shed for you. She also explained that after the supper was over, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Chaplain Gay went around the table, and then she washed young women's feet, just like Jesus had done. And when she had finished, one of the young women named Taylor said, But Chaplain, nobody washed your feet. And she bent down and washed Chaplain's feet. Taylor said that moment changed her, and she knew that she was supposed to do something with her life that involved helping others. And I'm excited to share that Taylor is now um, a practicing lawyer. She went to college and then on to law school. She finished her law degree at Northern Illinois, and now she works in private practice down in Texas. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, when we participate in acts of service, we see the light and we experience Christ in new ways. Whether it's worship, study, prayer, or service, all of this helps us experience God's love. Light breaks through and gives us the hope and the help and the insurance we need to be confident, be certain that God still shines. You all help God's light shine through in how you love and support our kids. And that's through, you know, your time, volunteering. And that involves, even if you're not volunteering physically at Cunningham, the work you all do as a congregation and that your United Women in Faith do looks like, you know, you have the rummage sale coming up. And that's an incredible way for how you are um, generating funds and support that go on to help missions uh, like ours. Um, you all are a source of light. I don't know if all of you realize this, but your church alone gave over $2,000 um, and is still giving. I was so grateful to receive a check even this morning that will go and help support our kids' daily needs. Um, you know, that light is generated in how you all financially support our kids, but also how you pray for our kids and for their families and our staff. Um, I got here a little late, so but I put a bulletin insert that actually has the prayers of some of our kids in it that you can hang on your fridge and maybe say a couple times a month. Um, and it's on the back table as you're leaving the, the sanctuary if you want to pick one of those up um, on your way out. Um, so thank you. All of these gifts um, help us support that gap between what the state and child welfare services reimburse us for what they think the total cost of care is for each of these kids versus what it actually costs to take care and provide all these incredible services for our kids. Um, so no matter how you all have helped God's light shine through, um, whether it's the prayers, quilts, Christmas gifts, or contributing even to the noisy change offering that the, during the children's message, uh, your devotion is deeply appreciated. Jesus is the light of the world. There is no corner of the world, no situation too dark for him. He shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome him. Please join me in a closing prayer. Light of the world, when we are overwhelmed, when all seems lost, break through with your light and renew our faith and trust in you. Amen. Brooke, thank you for such an uplifting message. And New Bethel, thank you for your continued support of Cunningham Children's Home. Apparently, we're making a difference. So uh, may I ask you once more to rise, please? And this time, let's let the light of the Holy Spirit shine through as you sing, please, the Spirit song. Oh. 
as we begin, do we have a printed the benediction as we leave? Or okay, okay. Let's join together in the benediction, please. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please greet Brooke at the exit of the church this morning. Thank you. Have a blessed day.